If you're watching this episode on our YouTube channel and you're interested in Hawker aircraft, Napier engines, the Airworthy rebuild of Hawker Typhoon JP843, or all of the above, please head over to our supporters channel. There's all sorts of extra information there, uh, early updates, early releases of videos, forums where we can interact and answer questions, and uh, share shop updates and videos that you'll see nowhere else. And it's only a few dollars a month and it makes a massive difference to this project. So please do head over there and subscribe to the supporters channel. If you're interested in subscribing and making a donation to the project, donations can be made through our website at typhoonlegacy.com. There you'll find a PayPal link where you can securely make any donation that you'd like to help see JP843 return to the skies. Welcome back to the Typhoon Legacy Channel, I'm Ian Slater, and today we're going to do an episode on the complete opposite end of the monocoque assembly from our previous episode, which was the uh, transport joint at the back. This being the forward ring, and right here you can see the station plates that we have for the forward ring on our fixture assembly. These um, have been modified a couple times, and I'll get into that in a little bit, but essentially what the forward ring is, is the closeout frame for the monocoque structure. And interestingly, it really doesn't carry very many loads. The primary load carrying frame is gonna be frame A, which is just aft of it here. So the structure between A and the forward ring is not really much more than a fairing. And I say that because the just forward of this is the cockpit structure, which is tubular. And in between here is an assembly they call the integrating structure, which is again a tubular extension of the cockpit, but it connects directly to frame A. The skins on the monocoque carry all the way forward to the front ring, and the front ring has seals on it to which the cowl panels seal up against. So it really is, like I say, not much more than a fairing. Before I get too far along with the production of frame segments for the front end ring, I wanted to show you some of the modifications we did to our own fixture because of modification 307, which was the sliding hood canopy on the Typhoon. As I'm sure many of you will know, the uh, Hawker Typhoon JP843 was produced and delivered in September of 1943, uh, serving with 197 Squadron until uh, I think about February of 1944, and then she went for modifications such as uh, rocket projectile modifications and 307, which was the fitment of the sliding hood canopy. And this is where our mod modification to our fixture came in. When we designed this fixture, we did it to the production variant of the sliding hood canopy. And that isn't necessarily true to what JP843 was because she had a retrospective mod imparted on the top end of this front end ring. So we went back, we redesigned the, the fixture a little bit, the station plates were redesigned, and I, when I say we, I mean Bruce, my father, <laughs> redesigned all of that for me and the frame segments themselves. With those modifications, we were able to actually put the retrospective front end ring top plates in position exactly as JP843 would have been fitted. Another thing that I had to look at was uh, something that I would left from when I initially set up the fixture. I set the fixture up to do all of our main frames and get all that forming done, and when I did that, I started putting the station plates on for the front end ring, and noticed there was a bit of an issue and the holes didn't want to line up properly. So not working on that area, I left it and not wanting to deal with it, I suppose, <laughs> uh, until now, and I, I have to deal with it to make sure it's correct. When we redid the modification area for the retrospective front end ring, I drilled all the holes, I took the whole assembly off, drilled all the holes uh, with the milling machine, I set up datums, I made sure everything was true and accurate, and that was great. But you'll see that this, this whole frame is in uh, two main segments. There's an angled portion for the top, and then a perpendicular to the aircraft statum portion for the bottom. The bottom portion was where my problem was. And what I found is one of the vertical legs, the steel legs on it, was, um, consistently drilled 55 thousandths of an inch off. I, I think there's six or seven holes there, and everyone was outboard by 55 thousandths. So that comes down to the fellow that uh, did the welding on it <laughs> and did the drilling and layout. I'm not sure what I did there, but it was wrong. So to fix it, I had to disassemble everything. I actually, I cut that leg off of the fixture itself and welded up all of the holes on it, placed it back on the milling machine, drilled everything accurately, 
one more time, verified it, <laughs> and then I went ahead and put it back on the fixture, welded it all up, and verified the assembly of the bottom and the top together. And I'm very happy that we are uh, within a few thousandths of an inch of being true, which is excellent for what we're doing. And uh, now we're ready to start looking at producing form blocks, uh, flat patterns, and uh, ultimately parts for the front end ring. The production variant of the Hawker Typhoon's forward monocoque for the sliding hood Typhoon contained four main components. And these were a bottom piece, then there's two separations where the integrating structure passes through, and then there's a port side, a starboard side, and a top piece. These are all sectioned in various ways. Um, you can see that the production variant, because it was built in four pieces, just like the earlier variant, the splice points on the side pieces were located at the quarter section splice points, and this made production easier. Uh, that wasn't the case with the retrospective action variant. You can also see that the side pieces on the production variant actually continue on a little higher than the retrospective ones. There are two, uh, I guess what you'd call bridge pieces that cover off the bottom corners, and this will connect the side pieces and the bottom piece. And the reason this is separated there is because the integrating structure literally passes so close through in that area that there's no way that the frame could continue. With the retrospective modification to the front end, you end up with two top pieces that are connected in the middle and at the angle joint. The side pieces are cut down to meet at that location as well. All of these main components of the front ring are fairly simple. The retrospective upper pieces are pretty interesting to me, so I'm going to leave them till last, and I'm going to go ahead and form the bottom piece and both side pieces. With the bottom segment and both side segments done, I'm now going to make the two retrospective um, modification components that go up on the top side of the front ring. Um, those are these interesting shaped components here. I'm not too sure why Hawker chose to make them the way they did. Um, there's a, a change in the inside flange direction, uh, which is quite interesting. But um, it also makes it interesting in the way that they're formed, and that's why I wanted to save them to last to show in the video. And that's because if you look back at uh, season one, I did an episode on shrinking and stretching when I was making the 
um, the flanges for the monocoque section there, sorry, the, the frame segments for the monocoque section, and the outside flanges were all shrinking, and the inside flanges, there's a lot of stretching involved in it, and a different way to form it. In this case, because of this, the interesting shape that's on here, you end up with the uh, outside shrink flange, which is pretty straightforward, and then you have an inside stretch flange, but then when it comes back around here, you have a shrink flange too. So this one is stretching, 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 shrink, 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 and then a lot of shrink there, and then stretch again. So I'll show you that now. So now I've got this shrink area here, and what I want to do is bring the material back onto itself or towards itself to help it shrink as it goes around this flange. And just as I do with all these shrink flanges on the outside and the stretch flanges on the inside, there's extra material on it right now that I can trim away as I go. And that makes it harder to do that shrink or stretch action, but it also gives you a little bit of control of what can happen. And it'll allow me to cheat a little bit, which I'm going to do for this in a few minutes. First thing is I'm going to ruffle that. So I'm going to push the material in and then I'm going to make sure that there's bumps and valleys in there. So if you go back to the beginning of the forming process when I did that outside flange, you'll notice that it ruffled just like this. That means that there's too much material and it needs to squish in. And that's what I'm going to do using the rivet gun. So you don't want to do this if you have a bunch of hard surfaces, but I've got a nylon face and a uh, MDF form block, so it works quite well. So that's about as good as I can get it with the, uh, the MDF in behind it, it's a little bit soft. You can still see those ruffles that need to be shrunk more, but you can also see that the part is bowed. And that's because even with those in there, it still needs to be shrunk more. There's too much material along that edge. Here's the problem with these dies. These are the best dies that I have for doing shrinking. They worked beautifully for finish on this. But the limitation is the width of them, and when you get into really tight curves, you'll end up marking and flattening and just destroying your material. A um, good example of that is exactly what we're doing here. As you can see, if I went with these dies, they wouldn't actually fit, and they'd flatten the part. So, impossible to do what we want to do with this set of dies. Now, I do have another set of shrinking dies, so I'll take these guys off. This set is typically used for steel or materials that don't need a, a structural finish on them. Uh, they're steel jaws, serrated jaws. They grab and they shrink like absolute crazy, um, but they do a lot of marring. So if you recall, uh, there's a lot of extra material on here. Well, maybe not a lot. There's a, a bit of extra material on here, and I'm going to sacrifice that by shrinking it with these aggressive jaws, and that'll help pull in the material closer to the radius that we're going to keep. So show you what I'm going to do there. So you can see it just chewed up that edge, but that's my sacrifice. And by shrinking that so aggressively, the material on this side of the shrink that's going to be kept, let's see, on the inside towards the radius, um, will have been pulled in as well. It'll relax somewhat, so it's good to overstretch a bit doing this, but uh, the sacrifice bit can be removed and we got our shrink into the material. So I'm happy with that. That turned out really nicely. I'll do a little bit of cleanup on the edges and this guy can go hang on the monocoque section with its friends. One last thing before it goes on the fixture is these two tabs. These get bent over and uh, attached to the canopy rail that is going to go on there eventually.
one upper front ring sliding hood modification component for Hawker Typhoon JP843. Both upper front ring modification segments are now done and all of these components will be thrown in the pile for our next batch of heat treatment and they'll come back and be trimmed to fit properly at the overlap areas. Thank you all very much for watching. I'd like to thank Dave Mace for sending some of the pictures uh, that were used in this episode of the conversion modification number 307 from car door to sliding hood. Dave is with the static rebuild of the early car door variant typhoon in the UK. Please remember to head over to typhoonlegacy.vhx.tv and subscribe to our supporters channel and uh, if you're able to head over to our website typhoonlegacy.com and make a donation to help us move forwards as quickly as possible. Thank you so much. Until next time, cheers.